Good morning. We're preparing, I hope, our hearts for a time of seeking, waiting upon the Lord, fasting, and praying. What are we fasting for? What is the purpose of fasting? Why? We, we, we have an enemy that needs to be defeated. So we fast and pray for what God will do, asking God to defeat the enemies, the enemy of our life. We want something to change in our life. We're fasting and praying for a revival. We want a stirring. We have roadblocks in our life, and we're not getting past them. And we fast and pray because we don't know what else to do. The Bible says, having done, having done everything, stand therefore and pray. And so we fast and we pray. What is fasting? We understand the, 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 the evidence of fasting. We don't eat. Or there, we, we're in a, a partial fast, and there are things that we give up, and we don't eat for that season. We, we don't do something. It's, you know, I, I was reminded, though, you know, when you're a pastor, when you're a minister, the definitions of, of scriptural definitions are just there. But, you know, we, we use the word holy, and holy is used so much for so many things about how we're supposed to be holy. And it's oftentimes, I think holy is, holy means I got to be perfect. If I'm holy, I'm perfect. Oh, well, they must be a holy man of God because look at them. They're a holy person. Do, do, you, do, you, do you really understand what the, what the, you know, I leaped somewhere, but I'm coming back. Do you really understand that the definition for holy, literally the definition for holy is set apart? Am I right, Marco, or am I right? The definition for holy is set apart. We are to be the set-apart ones. We are to be holy before God because we are to be set apart. Okay, so what does it have to do with fasting? When we are fasting, we are setting ourselves apart. We are removing something from our life. We are stepping away from something. I want to be set apart from food for a period of time. You know, these days, we've got to be set apart from a whole lot more than food. You've got to be set apart. When, you, when you're fasting, set yourself apart from those phones. And those iPads and all the things that can take your time and distract you. Set yourself apart. The whole point of fasting is to set apart from so you can be focused on. Set apart from the things of this world. Set apart from food to be set to God. We're drawing ourselves closer to God for what purposes that we might have. Why are we wanting to draw close to God? Because of whatever the issues that we are wanting to, to see dealt with in our life. Or because we want a move of God in our church. We want, a, we want a revival in our church. We want a stirring in our church. Lord, what do we do? We don't know what else to do. We put a sign out front. We come. We have regular hours. We meet. And Lord, what else are we going to do to get people to come in the door? We can go out and talk and witness and share. And some things are just not working. There's no, there's no resolve. There's, there's no evidence. And so what do we do? We fast. And we pray. And we ask God, Lord, would you move? I set myself apart to you that you would move. I want to read a few verses, and several verses, so, but they're all contained. So once you get there, it's there. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. And then after, after Matthew, we'll be in Mark. And so do Matthew and work with me here. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Prayer, a preparation for ministry. Fasting and prayer is a preparation for something. That we're doing something. We want something. We're seeking. We're, it's preparation for. What is it preparation for? What are we looking for? What are we wanting? Jesus is being prepared in this text. What's he preparing for? Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 
After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple, if you are the Son of God. He said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Lord Jesus, let your word speak wonderfully and powerfully. Speak wonderfully and powerfully to our hearts and our lives. I pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen. What is God preparing Jesus for? What is he preparing him for? Why does God send him out into the desert fasting for 40 days and 40 nights without food? And we read that text, verses 1 to 11, and the immediate is, well, he prepared him, he sent him out to prepare him to have a run with the devil. It seems to make sense to me. That's what we're reading, right? He goes out and he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Then after 40 days and 40 nights, he is tempted by the devil. He's tempted in ways that would affect him as the son of God, that would affect him as being the savior of the world. That if he fails the test here, any one of these three tests, if he fails them, then he fails to be the the only begotten of the father who has no sin. So he can't fail. Oh, but wait, he's brought to this place at the weakest time in his physical body because he hasn't eaten any food for 40 days and 40 nights. Tell me, how would you feel if you had not eaten any food for 40 days and 40 nights? How weak would your body be? I bet those stones would look really good if the devil says, I'll turn them into bread to give it to you right now. It'll be like fresh baked bread out of the oven. You haven't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights. I can give you all the power you're looking for. I'm tired. I'll give it to you, 40 days and 40 nights. But is that really the preparation that God is preparing him for? It's the immediate. But what follows this event? What follows these 40 days? What follows this travel into the wilderness where he is without and he is suffering in his physical sense, what follows that is his ministry. One of the things that we learn from fasting is, fasting is a call for us to set ourselves apart. Set yourself apart. Fasting isn't, well, I'm going to stop eating food, but I'm going to go out in my world, and I'm going to interact with my world the way I always do, and I'm going to go out and have all the fun and all the things that I always, I'm just not going to eat, and God's going to honor the fact that I'm not eating food. Fasting is more than not eating food. Fasting is setting yourself apart. It's self-denial, and we got that. Don't eat. But it's setting yourself apart. Therefore, when Jesus went into the wilderness, he set himself apart. He left all the human race for 40 days. He had no contact with other human beings for 40 days. He set himself apart. The only person he spoke with besides the devil, who spoke to him first, was God. He set himself apart from man. He set himself apart from the human society. And he set himself toward God. What do we learn from fasting? Set yourself apart from the things of this world and set yourself only on the name of the Lord your God. Set yourself on the name of the Lord your God. Why fast? 
because I want to, I want you to draw closer to the Lord your God. I want you to get closer to the one who knows you best and loves you most. I want you to be focused not on the latest TV thing on Survivor or something else or a big brother or big sister or big somebody who has no sense. When I see those commercials, I can't, I've never watched the programs. The commercials are nutty enough. Why would we spend the summer watching a bunch of nuts live their life openly? <laughs> set yourself apart from the things of your normal regime and set yourself to God to seek his face. Denying a food is denying your flesh. It's what your flesh craves. Instead, feed your flesh, feed your spirit, feed your spirit, feed your spirit. Instead of eating food, read the word of God because that's the food that your spirit needs. Seek the face of God for what he has for you. Let the spirit be fed while the flesh is starving. Let your spirit be fed while your flesh is starving. You can survive it. I don't know if you can survive 40 days. And if you've never fasted, jumping in 40 days, you might need to do something a little different. We're not calling a 40-day fast. We're calling a one-week fast, I think, right? Do I have that right, Mrs. Tilly? Yes, a one-week fast. Set apart from to be set apart to. That's the lesson learned in this text. Jesus left society and he got alone with God and nobody else. And he spoke with God and likewise. At the end, when his flesh is weakest, the devil comes in and says, basically, let me at him. I can turn him. I can bring up the temptation here. And he failed. Why? I believe it's not just because of who Jesus is. I believe it's because of who he spent 40 days with. It's who he spent 40 days with. I can fast and sit in front of a TV set all night long and, go and cry all night about how hungry I am, but I'm doing this for God. So, you know, how is that really helping you? What are you really getting away from? I'm fasting, but I'm going to talk to everybody on my Twitter and every Facebook and everything else about how horrible and terrible. It's been three and a half hours and I'm dying. I'm starving. I can't wait for this fast to be over. Well, how long is that going to be? A week. It's been three and a half hours and you're dying. What are you going to tell me when it's been 30 and a half hours? <laughs> you know, set yourself apart from. To set yourself apart to. There's a purpose for fasting. Jesus was preparing with his father to unleash a ministry that was going to revolutionize and shake up and tear down the strongholds of this world for the next three years. He was going to make such a difference, such an impact on this world over the next three years. And it began with 40 days in the desert without food for 40 days and 40 nights, talking with the Lord his God. Preparing much more than just this encounter with the devil. That, 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 that to seal the deal on, on three and a half years of ministry. That sealed the deal on going to the cross. That sealed the deal on dying for our sins. But that 40 days and 40 nights set up a whole lot more than that encounter with Satan. Because ministry was right on the heels of walking out of that desert. Ministry was right on the heels of walking out of that desert. And it doesn't always guarantee success in ministry because you fasted. You say, well, I'm going to fast and pray this week, and I'm going to give a hold to God, and, and then I'm going to go pray for my friend, and then my friend's going to be healed. Uh, God, how come my friend's not healed? Well, let me remind you of something. All Bible scholars should immediately remember this. Where was the first place Jesus went to minister? after leaving that desert. Where was the first place he went to minister after leaving this? I read it. Nazareth. How much ministry did he do in Nazareth? Everybody online can see that goose egg. The Bible says he could do nothing in Nazareth because they had no faith. 
They literally drove him out of town. It wasn't anything to do with Jesus. It had nothing to do with his being, a, being apart for God for 40 days and 40 nights. It had to do with the faith of the people that he went to minister to. It was nothing on him. It was on them. Are you hearing me? And it won't be the only time that this happens. But it happens here in Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Isn't that what they said about Jesus when he was born? When he was a child? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> Is there anything good left in Nazareth? Jesus. He goes away to be away from people, away from community, away from comforts. He goes away to be with God. So he is away from to be close to. He gets rid of all the potential distractions that would be in his life. For us, that includes phones, tablets, TV, computers, lots of things that can be distractions and distract us from what we are seeking to do. Now, if you're using your phone to read scripture, hallelujah. If you're using your phone to pull up the verses and, or your tablet to read the Bible and, and meditate on the things of the Lord, hallelujah. But if you're using it for other reasons, be careful that it doesn't become a distraction of what you're trying to accomplish. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. We're fast forwarding now in a time of ministry. Jesus has been training his, his disciples. He has, he has breathed on them and he has sent them out and they have done ministry and they've, they came back celebrating all that we, all that we saw even demons coming out of people. This is great, good news. But suddenly they come into a place where they do the exact same ministry that they've been doing, and the result is not the same. What happened? One plus one equals two. Now we come here and minister at one plus one equals zero. You'll get what I'm saying in a moment. Mark 9. Verses 14 through 29. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law were arguing with them. Getting into a debate with religion is, never ends well. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him into the ground. He foams at the mouth and gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. And so they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said. Everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. There's an honest statement right there. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked and convulsed him violently. And he came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. 
after Jesus had gone indoors. Now, hi highlight that, underline that, because Jesus stepped away. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. They had gotten so, ac so accustomed to walking in the power and the anointing that, that Jesus had breathed on them, and they were out ministering in the villages, and they marveled at the power of God wherever they went. And now they come to a place, and they're trying to minister to this to this father's son, and nothing's happening. There's no reaction, and there's no change. And how frustrating it must be in ministry when you've gotten used to praying for people, and suddenly you're praying for somebody, and nothing happens. Something's wrong. I remember hearing through the years, especially through the 1970s, 1980s, you know, when the, when the, when the, when the evangelists would come through, and you're praying for people, people are lining up, and everybody you pray for falls on the floor, and, and people are getting healed, and people's lives are changing. Suddenly, somebody comes up and prayed for, and they just stand there. They don't fall down. Nothing happens. Nothing changes. And the, the response is, there's no faith. It's not the evangelist. It's the person. It probably isn't the evangelist, and maybe it is the person, or maybe it's nothing, or maybe it's not his time yet. There's a lot of unknowns there. Jesus looks at what's going on here, and what, is he, what does he come into? What does Jesus walk into? He walks into an argument. And who's arguing? The people in the community with the Father and the disciples. And they're debating and they're arguing. And Jesus steps in and says, what are you guys arguing about? What's going on? What's the deal here? What's the problem here? And the man speaks up and says, the problem is your guys can't do the work. Well, that's embarrassing. You send your ministry, ministry team out, and they come back and say, we couldn't do it. I want you to notice something in this text. I told you, you need to under, underline, highlight, underscore that Jesus took them into a room. He took them privately. So number one, when there's, when there's deficiency, when there is frustration in ministry, and you have a leader that sends out leaders to do ministry, we're talking about fasting and praying and wanting to, see, wanting to see the hand of God move in our midst. And there are times when we will minister, and there are times when we will pray for people, and it seems like nothing is happening. What do you do? What did Jesus do? He took his disciples out of the environment. After he ministered to the, to the boy, after he healed the boy, and the boy is completely made whole and completely restored, he takes his disciples out of the situation and takes them into another room. Smart leader. Get them out of the hearing of the Pharisees or Sadducees or whatever religious leaders were arguing with the villagers, because that's the argument. The argument is between religious leaders, the villagers, and the disciples. That's what we know. And Jesus took his disciples out of there. What I find interesting is that when Jesus took his disciples out of the situation, Marco, and got them into another room, he doesn't rebuke them. He says in the crowd, how long am I supposed to put up with you? So he looks at the crowd in the environment and says, what is the matter with you? How long do I got to put up with your lack of faith? How long do I put up with your unbelieving? What is the matter? So who is he talking to? We have no idea. I'm assuming it's the religious leaders arguing and debating with the community, which also can't believe because they're arguing and debating with the disciples. And what I, come, what I come to terms with here, when Jesus takes his disciples privately, he doesn't rebuke him and say to him, what have I taught you? Didn't I breathe on you? What did I give you the Holy Spirit for? How come you couldn't do it? I taught you. I trained you. What's the matter with you? He doesn't correct them in any sense. They asked him. They said, Master, why couldn't we do this? Which tells me, Marco, that they tried. They tried. 
They, having done all, stand therefore and do what? Pray. We've done everything, Master. And what's Jesus' answer to that? There are some things that only come about through prayer. This boy needed some preparation prayer. You guys, if it's the guys, you guys should have been, you know, maybe he's saying, and I'm, I'm conjecturing here, maybe he's is saying to them, you know, every night I spend time in prayer with the Father, where were you? Maybe, I don't know. The father of the boy freely admits, I believe, but I have a lot of unbelief. So maybe the father is not prayed up for the ministry for his son. We know the religious people are not prayed up because this is a struggle that goes all the way to the cross with the religious leadership. Because they never embrace him and they never accept him. But Jesus gives that answer, which is really interesting, because that answer is not given with a rebuke, with any kind of a restraint, with any kind of a criticism. It's simply a statement that says to disciples, guys, this kind of ministry requires prayer. Why are we praying? Why are we fasting and praying? Because God is going to do something in this church and through this church. There are those who sense that God is doing something in this church and through this church. I want to tell you, several months ago, I went to visit my cousin, whom you saw. A, he was here last week, right? Or two weeks, Kevin? Two weeks ago? And while we were having lunch downstairs, we were talking. Now, several months ago, Kevin was at um, UConn Medical Center. He was in a really bad way there. In fact, there was a moment, there was a short time, we weren't even sure he was going to survive. Whatever, he, whatever his sickness was, it was very, very severe. And I was asked to go in. I went in, I saw him, and I spent time and prayed with him at the hospital. What I did not know was that after I went in and prayed with him, his circumstances changed that day. And he got better after that day. God's doing something. Kevin got out of the hospital, and he's fine. He walked in here with his father two weeks ago, and we had a great time meeting a, meeting a cousin we've never seen in our life and being able to have this, this time together because this young man was touched by the hand of God in that hospital room. I had a text this morning from somebody that I ministered to a few weeks ago, and I've been keeping up with, with this person, just kind of dialoguing with this person. And this person sent me a note this morning and said, Pastor, when you prayed for me, the day you prayed for me, everything going on in me left. And I had strength and I had positive assurance. I knew that moment that what God was doing, he had done something that day. God's doing something. He's doing something. People's lives are being touched. That tells me he's not done with this little church on Dunham Street. It's not over for this church on Dunham Street. In fact, I would tell you as I'm coming to my senior years, it's just getting started in this church. There's something going to happen in this church like I have not seen and you have not seen. It's just getting started. So, Bella, it's good to call the church to fast because something is about to unleash and unfold in this church with the next generation, with this generation being you and the next generation that's rising up. And we don't know what that is. We don't know what is about to unfold. We don't know what that ministry is going to look like. We don't know if we might have somebody on the floor here, shaking violently because there's a spirit needs to come out of him. And will we be prepared to cast that spirit out in the name of Jesus? I had somebody in my office several years ago with a demonic spirit, and we cast that spirit out, and that spirit left. I was so busy being offended that there would be a spirit in my office. I, 
how dare you be in my office? How dare you be in this church? Get out now in the name of Jesus. Out! And it left. So I know it works. You call the name of the Lord and watch the hand of God move and watch God do amazing things. You're ministering to your friend, Carly. Amazing things unfold and get before your eyes. God is still moving. God is still moving. And, and I just believe God for what he's going to continue to do. Just like I keep believing God, mercy, for what he's doing in your life. I have felt the hand of God on your life. I have prayed and sensed the move of God on your life. I know. I, I, I pray with you, and I, and, I, and I trust God with you for all the things that you're going through and the surgeries that are still ahead of you. But I just dare to believe God that his hand is on you. He is moving in you, and his hand is on you. He is touching you, and he is not going to let you go in the name of Jesus. I feel it. I sense it. I know down in here. I just believe that God is doing something really wonderful in your life. And I am looking forward to when some doctor looks at you and says, I don't understand what's going on, but you're fine. I'm just believing God for that. Can we trust God for the supernatural? Can we fast and pray and believe God for a move of his Holy Spirit in our midst? And can we have enough, enough umption, enough gumption, enough, enough courage to just trust God for whatever that looks like, that we don't have to have all the answers, and we don't have to have it all played out like a play card for a game, but that we walk by faith each and every day of our life knowing that God is in the middle of it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Can we trust God? I have one more text for you. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. These three texts all have something in common. Now, Jesus has been involved in ministry. They've been at it all day long. He's been teaching on the, on the mountainside. They've been doing, he's been, if you look before Mark chapter 5, you look at Mark chapter 4, there's a whole lot of parables and teaching that he's doing. This guy has been busy. He's tired. And they get into a boat, and they go across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. That is some incredible um, power of the, of the devil, isn't it? There's a legion in him, as we find out. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. These demons wanted to stay right where they were. They were content right where they were. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside, and the demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs and allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Quite a ministry. After a day of teaching, a rough boat trip across the lake, Jesus encounters a man with a great need. You don't know what time or day ministry will be called upon you. Are you ready? Are you ready? We learn to always be ready for ministry. 
Fasting and prayer sets you up. It equips you. It prepares you. It sets you apart. It moves you in the right direction. It gets you in the right condition. You need to be conditionally ready to go out and do the work of the ministry, whatever that looks like. And every one of us are ministers. Every one of us are ministers. Every one of us have an opportunity to minister to another person's life. Every one of us have the capacity to lead another person to Jesus Christ. Every one of us has the capacity to pray for somebody who's sick and see God raise them up. Every one of us have the capacity to cast out a demon out of somebody. Even if the thought of that scares you to death, do you have Christ in you? Do you feel like, the, do you believe the Holy Spirit is at work in you? You know what the text says, greater is he who is than he who is. So you have nothing to fear of a demon in somebody else. Are you saved? Are you filled with the Spirit? You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. Come on. Always be ready for ministry because ministry is rarely convenient. Ministry is rarely convenient. Ministry does not often happen on our time. It happens on God's time. Ministry is rarely convenient, and it's rarely packaged beautifully with a nice big bow on it. Ministry can be ugly. Ministry can be painful. Ministry can be sad. Ministry can be very stressful. Because we're talking about human lives, sometimes in the worst of their condition. And we step in and touch their heart, and we touch their life when we pray for them doesn't get more stressful than 2,000 demons in a man who can't even be chained with chains and iron. It can't be more stressful than this, that he can beat up any person or any group that could come near him. It doesn't get any worse than this than casting out demons. But Jesus is ready. He recognizes the need and he calls out the demon. He demands the identity of this demon. Demons do not want to leave. They like, they like their area. They like where they are. They like what they're doing. They don't want to be messed with. They recognize Jesus and they beg Jesus, just leave us alone. Just leave us alone. Just leave us alone. Just leave us alone. Don't let us leave the area. We love the area. We like the tombs. It's dead here. We're comfortable here among the dead. Demons do not want to leave the area, but Jesus casts them out in a herd of pigs, right? What do the pigs do? Down the hill and into the water, dead. Now the demons have another problem. Not Jesus' problem. If you continue on reading this text, which I did not continue to read, if you continue reading this text, with all this that God, that God has done, with all that Jesus has done by casting out these 2,000 demons and releasing this man and bringing this man back to his sanity and, and delivering him to the people that are in the community, the people look at what Jesus did, and they look at the man who had 2,000 demons in him, and they look at Jesus, and their answer to Jesus is, would you please leave? Oh, thank you for, for delivering this poor man who we've suffered the screaming and the yelling and the torturing that he's been going through all these years in the tombs. we got to listen to this every night. And you, ca you, you cast him out and you set him free and he's completely sane in front of us. Now leave. That's the thanks he gets. Don't always expect ministry to be a nice big bow on it with a big thank you gift. And a thank you note in the mail a week later. They want Jesus out. But Jesus looked at the man and the man who was delivered. And the man didn't agree with the crowd. The crowd told Jesus to leave. The man says, oh, Jesus, can I go with you? Can I stay with you? 
you touched me, you changed me, you delivered me, can I stay with you? I want to get out of this deep, dark place. I want to get out of this lonely place. I want to go with the Jesus ministry because there's a lot of action with the Jesus ministry. I want to be where you are because you're cool, Jesus. Jesus doesn't always tell people that he delivers and he ministers to to get up and go leave and go somewhere else. Sometimes he says, I want you to stay right there because I have a ministry for you right where you are. And sometimes when we get when we get touched and transformed and renewed and we got all this new vigor and all this new power, say, I don't want to stay in this church. This church is dead. I'm going to go where the action is. And sometimes God will say to you, you stay right where you are. Because I have a purpose and a plan for you. I have a purpose and plan for the church you're in, for the community that you're in, for the town that you're in. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Because this is what he says to, to this man. He says, Jesus says to him, I want you to stay. Stay right here. Now, the place where he is is called Decapolis. And he says to him, I want you to go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, how he had should given mercy on you. So what did the man do? He listened to Jesus. It's good to listen to Jesus. It's good to, to trust and obey, because there is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Yeah, old songs are still great. Savannah, you got that one. Trust and obey, hallelujah. So the man went into the capitalist and he did just that. He went into the town and he witnessed to them about who Jesus Christ is. He became the next deliverer of the gospel. He became a witness for Jesus Christ. He became that spokesperson. He will look at me. I was once in sin. I was chained. I was, I was nothing. I, I had no life. I had no thought. I had no liberty, and I was set free. I'm the man from the tombs, and I have been set free. I used to bother you at night with all my howling, and now look at me. I'm in my sanity, and I want to tell you about the person who brought me to my sanity. I want to tell you about this Jesus who touched my life and changed my life. We need a witness. We need people whose lives have been transformed, whose minds have been renewed, whose souls have been saved, whose hearts have been transformed and softened and lightened up for the power of Almighty God. And we need them to stand up in the community and say in their community right here, I want to tell you about a Jesus who changed my life and touched me and healed me and delivered me and did all this for me. I am not the same person that I was. I am now free. I'm no longer sick and diseased because he healed. I'm no longer in my in all of my habits and my drug habits and all the other gambling and pornography and alcohol, you name it, I had it. And now it's all gone because Jesus set me free. I'm standing here before you as a testimony, as a witness to the power of Almighty God. That's what our community needs. People who will stand up and declare to their whole community I am one who has been with Jesus. And he has set me free. You see, we need an encounter with Jesus. Pray. A week of prayer and fasting will set us apart from all the things that are normally in our busy schedules. And we're set apart from so that we can be set apart to to draw closer to God to draw closer to the one who knows us best and loves us most, to draw closer to him for what his purpose and will is for our life, what his purpose and his will is for our church. God, what do you have? Prepare us, Lord, for what's coming for our church. Would you prepare us, Lord? Would you stir us, Lord? The example I gave to you today is a 40-day fast. That's an extreme. That is a long time to go. And maybe you're not out for that. Maybe you're not ready for that. We're not asking you for 40 days. We're asking for a week. Maybe you have meds that prevent you from being completely without food. There are lots of other ways that you can fast. It isn't, it isn't that, that, that there's not a secret 
that unlocks in terms of fasting. Remember what fasting is. Fasting is denying the body. And you're not just trying to deny the body to show God you love him. You're denying the body so that you can focus more on your spirit. You're setting apart from to set yourself to. Get to the spirit of it. And so there are lots of ways to fast, but can you join us for a week of prayer and fasting? And say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to set myself apart. And there are a lot of other things besides food I need to get out of my life. And you may have to set that phone down for a week except for need, needful phone calls like sons who have new babies. <laughs> there are needs for that phone. But there are lots of things that we can just shut off and say, I, these, are, these are things I don't need. I don't need these things. And I'm going to put them aside. I'm going to shut my TV off at night. Because I don't need it on. Even if it is soccer, I don't need it. <laughs> or baseball, whatever else goes on in the summer. I don't need it. I need Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I need you. Are we together in this? Are we together in this?